Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in this beautiful space, right? It's gorgeous. So I am so glad that you're here. I'm going to invite you to take out yourself. So go ahead, I'll wait, take it out. And of course, like do the mandatory thing, like make sure it's on vibrate and silence and that the Macarena isn't gonna start playing in the middle of presentation. But I'm also gonna invite you to send a text. And invite you to think of someone personally or professionally that you wanna say thank you to. Something specific that they've done, something you're grateful for, just short, I'm talking one to two sentences, but send this text of gratitude. And I'm gonna do the same thing, go ahead. more moment. Right. When you're done, you can go ahead and put it on your purse or on the floor in your pocket or whatever. So why in the world do we just do that? What we know is that studies suggest that gratitude increases blood flow and activity in your hypothalamus, right? So that master gland that controls the hormones, oxytocin loves gratitude, that feel good hormone. So right now, you've got a little bit more oxytocin in your system than you did five minutes ago. And so today when I was thinking about, what do we wanna talk about for the next, 60 minutes. When we think about well-being, it's a giant topic. And I thought long and hard about what would be meaningful, what would have lasting effects, and what would be tangible. Because I'm a coach. So I like things that are doable, things that you can implement. And I got to thinking about one of the most meaningful articles and books that I've read in a long time called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And Palliative care nurse Romy Ware, she's Australian, um, and she spent well over a decade recording the regrets and the thoughts of people that were actively dying. And I can see the look on some of your faces like, hold up, I came for wellness, I am not here to talk about dying, right? I promise, we're not gonna get too deep into end of life care. But the work that I did before the University of Kentucky I worked as a associate director for a wellness um, nonprofit that served folks with life-threatening illness. And um, most of those folks went on to, um, to death, to actively die while I knew them. And what I knew about that seven years is that there is something very sacred and clarifying around what happens to folks as they are looking at their humanity and kind of figuring out like, whoa, I'm not going to be here for very much longer, so what really matters? And the good news is, is that we can glean this powerful insight from Roni Ware and really look at what are the top five regrets of the dying, because they're universal. When I was going through them, they really struck me, but we're not going to end it there. We're also going to then look at what does research say can help to counteract some of these universal regrets. So let's look at it. Regret number one, I wish I had had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Ugh, right, can you feel it? It's, it's, uh, it's palpable. So when I think about the idea of courage, I thought about the root word of the mean courage, and so the root of courage is core. It's the Latin word heart. To speak one's mind by telling all of one's heart. And very few researchers have more work um, around courage than Brene Brown. Any Brene Brown fans in here? Yes, yes, I knew it. Um, she does amazing research at the University of Texas, Houston, 
uh, her work, she's a PhD uh, social worker, um, but she researches things like courage, authenticity, shame, and connection. And so according to the work of Dr. Brene Brown, <clears throat> excuse me, authenticity is the daily practice of letting go of who we think we're supposed to be and embracing who we are. And what Dr. Brown says is that authenticity isn't all or nothing. You know, there's not like all authentic people and all unauthentic people. What she says about authenticity is that it's a collection of everyday choices. So this idea of living a life that's authentic, that's true to who you are and who you want to be, to your values, it's about choice. And I think I can speak with a lot of assurance saying that the University of Kentucky, our health and wellness program is here to help you live well. We're here to help you make authentic choices for you every single day. Choices that are gonna help you live well at home, choices that are gonna help you live well here at work. And so whether you are experiencing a lot of well-being and you feel good in your body and you just wanna kind of take it to the next level, or maybe you feel overwhelmed in your amount of stress. Maybe you feel completely perplexed as to what that next healthy move might be. We're here to help you, to take you as you are, right? This idea of come as you are, everyone is welcome. So we have some of, the, I think, some of the most talented staff around. Uh, we've got two exercise physiologists with two PhDs each of them. These two know a lot about the body. If you're needing support for moving your body in powerful ways, um, we've got a lot of help for you. We've had two dietitians that are some of the most non-shaming and open-hearted people you'll meet, right? They love chocolate. They encourage chocolate, right? So this idea, if you want to connect back in with your body, if you want to come home to your body, but aren't exactly sure how to do that and feel so disconnected, and are just sick of the diet treadmill, reach out to our Eat Well staff. They are some of the best in it is. We also have um, support for you when you need connection and are feeling disconnected from values, from your purpose, from really wanting to understand how to manage your stress in a different way. We can't make your stress go away, but myself and my amazing colleague, Jackie Hansen, we are here to help you hold it differently, to increase your resilience so that you are able to create healthy habits that you get you closer to well being in a different way. So, at the end of each of these regrets, I'm gonna offer you a practice, a courageous practice. So, courageous practice number one comes from Dr. Brene Brown, and she talks about the ingredients for joy and meaningless. And here's how it works. So this idea of making specific conditions, so making a list of specific conditions that are in place when things feel good, right? So when your life is working, when you feel peaceful, when you feel engaged, when you feel satisfied, what's happening? So I know for me personally, uh, I can't be hangry, right? So I feel good when I've eaten something, preferably with some good heavy protein some delicious carbs. Um, I feel good when I've had meaningful connection, which usually means putting my cell phone down, right? I feel good when things are cleaned up, when my desk isn't like a tornado zone, or when my house doesn't have like a thousand dishes in the sink, right? These are some things that I know help me increase meaning and joy, but you got to figure out what that is for you. What is going on when things are good and then check that list against daily habits and your to do how can you do more of those things that are going to help you experience more connection more connection to your values more connection to things that light you up and therefore being able to help you experience some more joy and true meaning all right regret number two i wish I hadn't worked so hard and missed the good things in my life. Yeah, I'm seeing some head. So I wanna hear, what's the good stuff? What matters most? Call it out, I wanna hear. What matters most in your life? 
children, family. Yep, what else? Yeah, people. Yep, what else? Hmm, service. Yeah, serving something bigger than yourself. Yeah, anything else? Any animals? Animals, yes, right? Absolutely. So what we know is that our brain is shaped by experiences, molded by what we pay attention to. Dr. Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a brilliant neuroscience scientist, talk about that neurons that fire together, wire together. So we know that when we have positive experiences, our brain lays down a pathway and helps make that experience stronger. So, what we also know is that we need to focus on experiences, not conditions. What in the world does that mean? I'm gonna read um, something from Dr. Rick Hansen, also a, a brilliant neuroscientist at Stanford. And he said, so conditions are like being partnered, right? Having children, having a new car, getting a promotion, they are very specific. Experiences might be feeling the experience of love, feeling the experience of joy, feeling the experience of delight. So even without a romantic partner or a new promotion, you can still experience delight. We're so attached to the outcome. And when that happens, when we're stuck on only feeling joy or connection through a specific outcome, we miss it. Oftentimes we miss the goodness in our life because we're so fixated on, I have to have that house. I have to have this number on a scale. I have to have this X amount of money in my checking account, right? So what we know is that when we, um, when we focus only on those very specific conditions, we miss the opportunities of those needs getting met in other ways. So people aren't unhappy because they don't have a car, a new car, or they don't have a promotion. They feel unhappy when they don't feel safe, when they don't feel a sense of achievement or accomplishment, when they don't feel satisfied, when they don't feel connection and love. That's why we don't feel happy, right? Not because of these external conditions, but we're so focused on, I have to have this thing in order to be happy. So you gotta figure out what experiences are most important to you? How do you want to feel? What matters most to you? What is your good stuff? And do you know how to cultivate that good stuff? So if you want to have more time with your family, real quality time, do you know how to cultivate that? And do you know how to lock it in when it's happening so that your brain can remember? So what we know is that when you are getting really clear about the experiences that matter most to you, then you need to learn how to savor them. So let's say that nature really lights you up. You love being outside, you love being at the Arboretum, you love watching birds and the whole shebang, right? So what we know about the brain is that oftentimes we give away the memory to our camera. Right, so we take a picture of a beautiful sunset or of a really exciting dinner that we're eating that was delicious, and then we just kind of move on. And what, we, what neuroscientists suggest is take the picture, there's nothing wrong with the picture, but then stop and savor. So here is how we can actually lengthen the experience of the good so that your brain can go back to it and remember it later. Number one, you gotta lengthen the experience, right? So stare at that sunset and take it in. Notice and bring on as many of your senses as possible. So look at the vibrant colors, but then also notice like, what do you smell? Maybe it's the fresh cut grass. What do you, what do you feel like? Maybe it's the, the warm, humid air on your skin. What, what, did, what did things taste like? Maybe you have some peppermint gum in your mouth, right? So bring on as many of your senses as possible because that lays down a new neural pathway in your brain and you can come back and remember it and it can give you added well-being in the future. All right. Number three, 
I wish I had had the courage to express my feelings. And I added in their needs because what we know now that probably folks who were actively dying didn't know at the time is that feelings and needs are incredibly thrilling. So Dr. Rick Hansen, he, if you're into neuroscience and you're into, like if you kind of geek out on it the way I do, walk, don't walk, run to Amazon and order it today. He's got a brilliant new book out called Resilience. And it is fabulous. Um, so he has written that we all have these three basic human needs. Safety, satisfaction, connection. Every single person on the planet is walking around trying to get their needs met. The problem is, a lot of times, we're getting our needs met in ways that aren't satisfying and are actually pretty destructive. So think about, um, think about the brain as a house, right? So safety is our most primal need. It was the part of the brain that developed in our brain stem. You can think about that part of the brain as like the basement part of your brain. It's the one that's least kind of sophisticated. It easily uh, gets taken over when it starts to freak out, when it doesn't feel safe. That's where your fight or flight reaction lives, right? Um, that is what, when, you, when your like brain stem gets taken over like, Adios, amigo. It's, it's bad news, right? So the idea of um, safety, meeting that need, is met by avoiding harm, right? It's a shocker. Surprise. So what we know is that this part of our brain is the most primal need. Our brain will go to this need first and foremost because it wants to keep us alive. That's why it's here. That's what it's trying to do. The second need that we have is satisfaction, and that kind of lives on the main floor of your brain. It's got some more sophistication. It lives in the subcortex. Um, and it's all about rep approaching reward. It likes to feel satisfied. It likes to feel satiated. It's why you always go for carbs first. That is what, yeah, uh-huh, yep. That lives in the subcortex. It likes to feel that sense of pleasure. That is where satisfaction takes over and contentment. The third need, which developed in the neocortex, so that's the last part of our brain to, to develop. It's kind of living in the top floor, right? The most redesigned attic part of the brain. Um, that is all about attachment. Everything we do is about attaching, of wanting to feel that sense of love, that sense of, of connection of being known, of being understood, right? And so we know that when our needs are being met, we're in that responsive green zone. We're feeling pretty good, like yeah, all right. And then we know when one of those needs isn't being met, we head out into the red zone. It's where we get really reactive. And so what Dr. Hansen suggests is that in order to um, stay in the green zone, we need to, um, we need to, to really take in and meet our needs, not deny them. And so even being able to understand, like when you're feeling, you're kind of freaking out, kind of see and figure out like, all right, well, what do I need right now? Maybe I need to eat. Maybe I'm feeling um, unsafe in some way. Maybe I'm just longing to be understood in connection. So if you can figure out what need isn't being met, sometimes it's multiple needs at the same time. It's all right, right? That's a part of it. The second piece of it, though, is when you are unable to kind of meet that need in the immediate, what do you do? One of my favorite tools for meeting this is the courageous practice number three called the loving kindness meditation. This truly helps to meet those needs um, in some kind of primal ways. And so I'm gonna invite us to do this together right now. This is one of my favorite tools that I go to when I feel overwhelmed. When I'm looking on the news and things feel too big, too overwhelming, too far gone try to come back to the loving kindness meditation. Yesterday on my way here, I saw a really horrible accident when I was on the freeway, and I went to the loving kindness meditation. It's something that I can do to help feel like there's some control and a sense of goodness. There's also a lot of um, 
research that supports loving kindness meditation around promoting empathy, right? It is one of the coolest things you can teach your kids, you can teach your coworkers, you can teach yourself as a way of calming down the body and the brain, as well as offering love and empathy out. Here's how it works. First of all, we're gonna offer it to ourselves. Um, may I be happy, may I be healthy and safe, may I be at peace. Then I'm going to invite you to offer that blessing to somebody who's really easy to love. Somebody maybe in your office or at home or a, a really close friend that puts a smile on your face and um, just brings you a lot of goodness. The third round, I'm gonna invite you to do it for somebody who's neutral. Maybe somebody who's sitting in your row somebody that you passed on campus today that you don't really know, maybe you saw them in Kroger, and that just, you don't have overly positive or overly negative feelings towards, it's just someone who's neutral. The fourth time, I'm gonna invite you to offer this for someone who is really hard to get along with. Somebody, I'm not gonna invite you to do it for the person who's hurt you most in life. That's gonna be too big and too much. We're not doing that today. But what I am gonna invite you to do is think about somebody who drives you bonkers and see if you can as genuinely as possible offer that blessing to them. And lastly, I'm gonna invite us to do it for all of campus. All right, so here's how it works. I'm gonna invite you to just close your eyes if you feel comfortable with that. And I'll just lead it through. Just take some deep breaths. I'm gonna invite you to put your hands on your heart we know this, this helps to activate our mammalian response of comfort that we often received when we were babies being fed. And just quietly to yourself, quietly in your heart, not out loud, offer this blessing to yourself. May I be happy. May I be healthy and safe. May I be at peace. And when you're ready, I invite you to picture someone in your life who's really easy to love, who lights you up into a gift to you. And when you're ready, I invite you to offer this blessing to them. May you be happy. May you be healthy and safe. May you be at peace. And next, see if you can picture someone in your mind's eye who you feel neutral towards. Somebody you've recently seen, maybe somebody in your office that you don't really know. And when you've got your vision in your mind, I invite you to offer the blessing to them. May you be happy. May you be healthy and safe. May you be at peace. Next, as you're able, think about somebody who's just getting under your skin. Somebody who's annoying you and you are struggling to be in relationship with them. And as you're able, as much authenticity as you can, see if you can offer this blessing to them. May you be happy. May you be healthy. Safe. May you be at peace. And lastly, I invite you to open your heart wide, wide, wide and see if you can offer this blessing for all of campus. May we all be happy. May we all be healthy and safe. May we all be at peace. And so it is. Thank you. All right. Number four. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. What we know is that research suggests the number one indicator of happiness and well-being are healthy relationships. When we are in relationship with people that are healthy, we feel better. When we're in close relationships with people that are toxic, our well-being suffers, right? So 
as we know, as we just talked about a few needs ago, we had that need to connect. It is visceral, it is who we are as humans. But we also know that in the world of technology, where we are able to Google anyone at any time and like <laughs> figure out where they live, right? When we are able to see what our long lost high school sweetheart just ate for dinner on Facebook, right? We have the ability, we're wired, we can, we're connect, but social media isn't doing us any favors. Constantly being set and in touch is oftentimes leaving us feeling more disconnected than ever. And it's tricky because we think when we go onto Facebook, when we go onto Instagram, when we reach on Twitter, right? Even just sending a text sometimes, we, we, we're trying to connect and yet oftentimes we, we leave feeling more disconnected. This happened to me last night, 12, 13 hours ago, I kid you not. I was, I just got into Lexington, I was laying in bed, trying to sleep, thinking about this keynote today, went to Instagram, don't judge me. And so I'm on Instagram and I'm looking through the feed and I see one of, um, one woman, one woman that I grew up with, very old friends, and she looks beautiful. And she's with her daughter, who's a teenager, who also looks amazing. And they're doing this service project together. And immediately I'm like, the shame storm start. I'm like, she is such a good mom. They are living out their values. Oh, look, they have such a close relationship. It's like the Gilmore girls. They're just so close. And immediately I'm like, oh, I don't think I could ever get my daughter to do that. There's no way she'd want to come. I'm a bad mom. She's a good dad. Or she's a good mom. Da, 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 right? And immediately the division starts. I know this stuff, guys. I teach this stuff. I know it more than probably most folks. And yet I totally fall into it right? So to be able to step out in that moment and be like, hold up. I had a yoga teacher that would often say, comparing leads to despairing. No matter what, whether you compare up and you think you're doing great, or whether you compare down, you are always are, are in that place of despair. And social media, so help me, is like that giant red button of compare despair. So I'm not here to villainize technology. We need it. It's important. But to kind of notice is what you're doing to try to connect, is it working? Is it getting you closer to connection or is it leading you further away into feeling a sense of disconnection? The, the main message here is to be intentional and to reach out to people in as real of a manner as possible. What we know is that oftentimes it is the hardest to, to call, right? And when was the last time you like, called a friend instead of just texted them. Um, but the idea of like telling people they matter as specifically as possible, right? So making a habit. Um, on Tuesdays, I try to send a, a text of gratitude. We did it today. You are already got one Tuesday down, right? So this idea of texting somebody and just saying, hey, I care about you. Thanks for being in my life. So research suggests that not only is it good for the person who receives it, also really good for you. So the courageous practice um, really goes with this. This comes out of uh, Dr. Martin Seligman. He is a professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's got a ton of research around the gratitude letter. And it seems a little scary at first, right? But I invite you to think about it. The first piece is to Write a letter, doesn't have to be long, just to somebody you wanna thank. Somebody that you, um, you have some gratitude for that you feel maybe doesn't know how much you appreciate them. The magic here is about writing it down and the way that it actually lights up a certain part of your brain. The second piece is to take the letter, this is the scary part, and deliver it in person if possible and read it to them. I know, right? To re say, I'm doing this thing, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to increase my well-being, I wrote you this thing, don't say anything, just let me get it out, right? Yeah. So I did this with my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Shackleford, um, probably about two years ago. And I couldn't find Mrs. Shackleford's um, address, but I wrote her an email. That's what I, all the information I had. Mrs. Shackleford, little did she know, 
increased and, and created so much passion for social justice and for languaging. Every month she would teach us a new language, which is why I can recite a poem in Aztec and can speak in German to 20. I'm five, dry, fearful, and sexy, when I'm noisy. Like, I mean, that's in there from fifth grade. She taught us American Sign Language. She told us about how she grew up and the incredible kind of feats that she had made as an immigrant from Mexico and her passion for social justice. Like, that stuff stuck. And I didn't know if she knew. And I sent it, and I got the most incredible email back that I still sometimes read. Um, I get kind of emotional just thinking about it, right? So this idea of reaching out to someone who doesn't even know, maybe, what sort of impact they've had on your life. It's powerful. So according to Dr. Seligman and his research with the gratitude letter, so it increases your sense of well-being. It helps to change the way we think about the past. Very interesting. It can make us feel good in the present moment, yes. It helps us to think more positively about a future. And not only is the gratitude letter good for the friend who gets it, right? So their well-being spikes up your well-being for writing the letter actually surpasses the receiver who gets it. Powerful stuff. Lastly, I wish that I had let myself be happier. Oh, so I sometimes will work with clients and they'll tell me, I'm just, I'm just a negative person. It's just how I am, I wake up grumpy, I'm just negative, right? So there's some interesting research, we're not even gonna into it, it's a totally different conversation for a totally different day, but Dr. Liebermierski, Sonia Liebermierski studies um, uh, twins, identical twins, and looks at happiness in DNA, and people are born happier, that we just know, right? Some people, my husband for sure, wakes up happy. Yay for me. So, yeah, he's a good guy. He's a good guy, but sometimes I want to say, it's six in the morning. So, so what we know, some people are born happier, but we are not stuck. The powerful news of the last 15 years, I think, has got to be around what we know about our brains and how we can affect neuroplasticity. Like, our brains can change. That's the good news here, everybody. So we have something called the negativity bias. We've all got it. It's not just you. Carrots and sticks. So what we know is that our ancestors, those cave people, right, they were, they were looking for carrots and they were looking for sticks, right? They're out hunting and gathering and doing that thing. But the motivation of the stick, that in, what I should say is that a stick has most urgency to it, right? The stick is the thing that if you get hit by it, you die. So our brain is constantly looking for sticks. We're looking for negativity. We're looking for things that could hurt us. We're looking for the saber-toothed tiger. When is it gonna come? What's it gonna do? I'm gonna start preparing for it right now. It's probably right around the corner, right? Our brain is constantly, constantly looking for the stick. It's scanning for bad news in the body and out of the body. It is focused tightly on the stick and it loses the big picture. Whatever that thing is that you're nervous about, you blow it up. It overreacts to the negative. That part of our brain, right, it fixates, it ruminates. So you maybe will have 10 beautiful things that happen to you today and one really bummer stick. What do you remember tonight when you go to bed? What do you talk about at dinner? The stick, right? That's how our brain is wired because that's how it survived. Because those cave folks that were like gathering berries and looking at the clouds and focusing more on carrots, when the saber-toothed tiger came, boom, they were gone. No more carrots for tomorrow because the stick just took you out, right? So what we know is that Dr. Rick Hansen talks about how our brain, negative experiences are like, or are like Velcro for the brain. They just stick, the stick sticks. I, I should coin that, I just thought of that. The stick stick, people, right? Hashtag stick stick, um, right? They, they, they stick on, and that is really tricky when we're trying to think about the positive experiences, and they're like Teflon. They just slide off. The brain has a really hard time 
because it's wired. Our primitive brain, the one that lives in the basement, it's all about survival. But the good news is that we can rewire the brain to focus more on the positive, to experience the whole. Because the goal here isn't to like poo-poo the sticks, right? I mean, we want to honor the sticks. We want to honor the tough stuff that exists in our lives. They're real. And this idea of kind of figuring out how can those things teach us? What do we need to do to work with them and not fixate so that we can more positively look at the good. And that is what the courageous practice number five is all about, three good things. This also comes from the University of Pennsylvania with Dr. Seligman. Some more really interesting research around this one. It's one of my favorite practices um, that I do personally as well as with my clients is three good things. It's really simple. Many social psychologists will talk about how gratitude is your biggest bang for your buck. It's like the holy grail of well-being because there's such a positive correlation with um, how it increases your brain function and overall sense of well-being without taking a lot of time. So it's like a win-win. So number one, every night, I like to do this before I go to bed. You can talk about it, that's fine, but what Seligman suggests is that writing it down, once again, is where the power is. So the first thing, write down three good things that happened to you. Just like stop at the CVS, Get a little notebook, put it by your bed, and just have it there. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Write down three good things that happened to you today. They can be little things. They can be big things. You'll probably find that it varies. It's fine. Something that just really stuck with you. The second piece, think about why it matters, right? So we're looking for bullet points here, people. We are talking like get this thing done in like three minutes because the longer it takes, the less your brain's going to want to do it. So like bullet point the three good things and then write about why it matters. So maybe back to that sunset, you saw a beautiful sunset. Why did it matter? Because it, it was, it, it connected in with your sense of nature and your love of beauty, right? It, it met a value for you. Or maybe you were on a walk with a really good friend and you had a had some connection time with them, right? So, so see if you can relate the good thing that happened to what your value is, why it mattered. And then lastly, after a week, look back on what you've written. Um, and so this is what's really powerful is that people who did this for one week showed an increase of well-being. If you kept doing it week two and week three and week four, like it pretty much stayed the same as week one. But at that week five point, so at a full month of figuring out and doing the three good things, that's where people saw another big jump in their overall well-being. And everybody, you don't have to do this perfectly. Like, so you miss a couple days, just go back to it, right? It's, it's not like it's going to mess up your well-being. You can't screw this up, right? So get into the practice of, of doing it, of making it a habit, and just notice. If it's something that you like, just notice how you feel. So lastly, I'm going to end with one of my very favorite um, short videos about the power of gratitude. So my friends, this is the question that I, that I invite you to kind of sit with. What is one thing I can do today to live well without regret? Think about what regrets kind of captivated you? What one did you resonate with? And where do you want to take it? What do you want support with? We are here as the University of Kentucky Health and Wellness. We are here to support you um, to truly live a life full of courage and meaning and purpose, of less stress um, and of more connection both on campus and off campus. So please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know how we can support you. Thank you so much for being here. Be well.